Welcome to Future Makers, your invitation to cutting-edge debates on our changing society with leading thinkers from the University of Oxford and beyond. We began this series by discussing international reports and their predictions. And the next logical question we might ask is what steps we need to take to prevent the dire consequences they warn us about. So what does our current infrastructure look like? And how far is it from where it needs to be to meet our international commitments or even our own challenge to be net zero by 2050? How much do our working practices and lives contribute to how green the country is? How do we compare to other countries? And what can we learn from them? And how can we all promote and preserve biodiversity across the whole globe? In short, how do we build a greener country and how do we contribute to a greener world? With me to discuss this today are Professor Cameron Hepburn, Director of the Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment, who has provided advice on climate policy to a number of governments, Alison Smith, a senior researcher at the Environmental Change Institute, who's worked on a number of EU climate projects and is the author of The Climate Bonus, Co-Benefits of Climate Policy, and April Burt, who has spent the past eight years working in conservation management in the Western Indian Ocean and is now part of Oxford's environmental research team. Welcome to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cameron, if I can start with you... It strikes me that to talk about potential change, we first need to understand what the current situation is. It's difficult to define being green, but how green would you say the UK's current infrastructure is? Could you paint a general picture for us? Peter, irrespective of how you define green, the answer is we're not very green. In absolute terms, we have a very long way to go. In our transport infrastructure is still largely fossil fueled, whether it's aviation, shipping or road transport. Our buildings are inefficient and leaky and uh, problematic. And our power system, of course, uh, still has very significant amounts of fossil fuel power generation assets on it, uh, and we need to get to net zero. But having said that, relative to many other countries, we're actually doing incredibly well. And our trajectory is coming in the right direction fairly quickly on some of these dimensions. So if you take climate change and greenhouse gas emissions, if you go back to 2013, the power fleet had around 50% coal on it. Today, it's a couple of percentage points of coal. So we've basically taken most of the coal out of our power generation system in five or six years. That's impressive progress. Now, we're making far less impressive progress on questions like uh, the transport infrastructure, but we're making good progress uh, and certainly good policy shifts in terms of thinking about uh, land use and air pollution. We've made some major strides on in, in recent years. So it's a fairly mixed report card relative to many other countries the UK is doing well, relative to where humanity needs to be and where the UK ought to be as a leading industrialised economy, I think uh, could do better. I mean, it's slightly worrying, actually, to hear that we're doing incredibly well relative to other countries, but yet we're not doing nearly well enough. I mean, that spells out a pretty grim picture for the world, does it? Well, it's grim in the sense that we are not where we ought to be and there is a long way to travel. It's optimistic in the sense that the rate of change towards being a greener country and a greener planet is accelerating. The technologies that we need are coming through the system. You know, there's fantastic developments here in Oxford, in, in solar, in electric vehicles, in clever, efficient motors, and all around the world. So I like to think of it as a swarm of human intelligence that is now finally after you know, 30 or 40 years of delay, started to focus like locusts on these questions of environmental sustainability. And, and we are starting to generate the answers and to deploy them. Okay. So it's not all that bad. So because countries can learn from each other, uh, it means that if, if we can get our game together, th that actually augurs quite well for the rest of the world if they're prepared to follow in appropriate ways. 
Yeah, but that's true. And and we are indeed leading in some ways. But we don't have to lead in all of them. Other countries are leading in, in certain other areas and we can follow them. But So there is this nice process of, of international learning that's, um, that's happening now. Right. Thank you. Alison, would you like to add to that? Sure. Yeah. So Cameron's painted a semi-optimistic picture of the kind of technological situation that we're in at the moment with respect to power generation, for example. My experience at the moment is more perhaps with the planning system and not just the grey infrastructure in the country, but also the green infrastructure. And I don't have a terribly optimistic picture to paint there. There has recently been the Rainsford Review of Planning, which basically concluded that our planning system is not fit for purpose. His first recommendation was that we should rewrite that and place sustainability at the heart of the planning system. At the moment, we're building unsustainable new developments. So there's been a recent review by Transport for New Homes. They visited 20 new developments around the country and found that practically all of them were not connected to public transport systems. They consisted of really bleak, unattractive acres of concrete and, and brick and car parks. Some of them didn't even have pavements that you could walk along or push a pushchair along. So people were like walking on two inches of grass at the edge of the verge and braving the traffic as it whizzed past. So there's a lot to be done, I think, with planning sustainable communities. And don't forget that when a new community is built, it's probably going to sit there for 40, 50 years with badly built, inefficient homes, people who are confined to having to use their cars with no alternative choices for walking or cycling or using public transport. So I think there's a lot more that could be done in terms of planning sustainable communities for the future. It seems appalling that it's come to that. I mean, how could that be allowed to happen? Well, I mean, the Rainsford Review gives a really detailed dissection of what's gone wrong in the planning system over the years. But a lot of it's to do with the drive towards deregulation in general and prioritising building as many houses as possible, as quickly as possible, and therefore perhaps bowing to what developers want to do. There are various loopholes to do with financial viability of developments, which means that developments can start off really well planned and then those aspects of good planning like green space get progressively chippled away and weakened as it, as it passes through the planning process. Well, there may be two different aspects there, I imagine. One of them is obviously money. If you've got developers involved, they're going to have money and that might incentivise certain types of development that are going to sell them lots of houses. But another one might be the target to build more houses, right? I mean, is, is it has it been very largely driven by the perceived political incentive to get more houses built? Yes, I mean, I'm not an expert, in, so I wouldn't want to comment too deeply on this kind of thing. But the way I see it, Clearly, there are people struggling to get on the housing ladder. There are waiting lists for new homes. There's a huge demand for affordable houses. Uh, my concern is that we're not building many affordable houses. Developers will build maybe 5% affordable houses in their development, and the other 95% are investment properties or larger houses for you know more well-off people, maybe second homes. We're using our land in a way as an investment bank. We're not building the affordable, sustainable houses that we desperately need for the future. Right. I mean, one thing I was wondering there was it, it, there's been such a lot of noise about the need for more houses to be built. Is it possible that part of the answer here is to get better targeting structures so that the sorts of metrics that are used for assessing new developments take into account the sorts of things you're talking about? Yes, I mean, most councils will have a target for affordable homes, but it might still only be at best perhaps 30% of a new development. And even that will get um, chibbled away during the planning process. But I'm also thinking about things like uh, connection to public transport, green spaces and so on. H have they not figured very much in, in the planners' objectives? There have been wonderful sets of standards drawn up for things like um, eco-towns, but only one eco-town ever went ahead. I think about 14 were planned. Uh, and that's actually around northwest Bicester, where they have a beautiful design for... Um, a very environmentally friendly development. A very small part of it has already been built and there's another part due to be built. And they've gone to great lengths there to build in sustainability. So they've got zero carbon homes, they've got public transport links, they've got walking and cycle paths. In terms of the land use, they've retained all the existing hedgerows and turned those into green links for people to use with cycle paths running alongside, big buffers for wildlife. So it's a beautiful example of what can be done. But since then, the legislation has changed and there's no longer the onus to build to those standards. So that, that's because of political change? Exactly, yes. yes. Right. So that, that was then replaced with the garden towns where there's no mandatory standards. They're all voluntary standards. I mean, the garden towns still have a very nice set of standards built, um, set by the TCPA, the Town and Country Planning Association, where they say things like um, houses should be close to public transport links. There should be a certain amount of green space, but none of that is mandatory. Can I just ask you about a different aspect of, of greenness, namely pollution? Sure. So we have made great strides over the last few decades 
air pollution has been decreasing, yeah. but it still hasn't decreased enough. Still, we have 5% of all attributable deaths in this country are due to air pollution, which is clearly too many. We're also not meeting our targets to reduce air pollution. Um, we're exceeding our targets for nitrous oxide, uh, nitrogen dioxide, sorry, in many places, um, especially in places like London and other city centres. The actual existing standards are exceeded. And we're also missing our targets to reduce pollution for particulates, for um, nitrogen, from ammonia, for many others. And then we've got new pollutants appearing like microplastics and carbon nanotubes, ultrafine particles, which are very, very concerning. So there's a lot more that could be done. And in terms of water quality as well, um, I think only in terms of rivers, 86% of river bodies had not reached good ecological status um, a couple of years ago. And most of them are failing on the grounds of phosphorus pollution, which comes from sewage treatment and also from agricultural runoff. And our groundwater, um, half of our water bodies, our groundwater bodies are polluted with nitrate from fertiliser runoff. So, and they're actually getting worse, not better. So there is a lot that we still need to do. Yeah, and you mentioned plastics. How are we doing in that area? Well, I mean, many of our listeners may have seen recent um, programmes on the television about the fate of the plastics that we send for recycling. And many of them, unfortunately, do end up overseas in illegal waste dumps where the plastic bags just blow off into the nearby jungle or into the nearby streams and end up in the ocean. So I think we're becoming more and more aware that the plastics that we thought were being safely recycled, that's not always the case. And I think we do need much better recycling systems, perhaps to build more local recycling plants in this country where we can actually see what's happening and recycle them properly. April, tell us a bit about what you've seen over in the Seychelles. About 8 million tonnes of plastic is going into the oceans every year, largely as a result of mismanaged waste. In the Indian Ocean, for example, it is fringed by countries with almost 100% mismanaged waste. And we in the UK have been shipping our waste out to these countries. We didn't realise potentially that most of it's going into the oceans, or not most of it, but um, huge amounts of it is going into the oceans. It then gets moved around on the currents by the wind, and the end point for some of it is these remote island ecosystems or small island states like the Seychelles. The Seychelles has 115 islands stretching across a huge, uh, vast area of ocean, and waste from all around the world, not from Seychelles, is ending up on these biodiversity hotspot islands one of which is Aldabra Atoll, a UNESCO World Heritage Site um, that's been bombarded by trash for the last 40 years. And this is now impacting endangered species like green turtles, uh, giant tortoises, seabirds, landbirds. Um, so it's having a huge impact. And one thing we really do need to realise is that the things that we do in this country are not just impacting us and the way we live our life, they're having immediate impacts on the way other people live their lives as well. Right. Can you tell us a bit about what you've been doing there? I've just led a project to clean up Aldabra's key turtle nesting beaches of plastic pollution. Alongside this project, we also wanted to run research to try and inform ongoing management of the threat of plastic pollution to these island ecosystems and how we can introduce better waste management systems to countries like Seychelles. At the moment, they don't have recycling facilities but they're not just having to deal with their own waste production they're having to deal with tons and tons we estimate about 500 tons just on Aldabra alone of plastic pollution coming from elsewhere they've got a big task ahead of them just to deal with that and how in practice have you been clearing up the plastics from the turtle nesting sites and that sort of thing what what does this involve Aldabra is extremely isolated and that's partly why it's so special it's been protected for many many years and its isolation has helped it um, remain a pristine ecosystem but what it can't escape are the threats of plastic pollution that's arriving and the threats of uh, climate change impacting the coral reef ecosystems there in order to even launch this expedition and this project, we needed to raise a lot of money because logistically it's very um, expensive to run any projects down in that area. This meant getting companies on board. The government was also on board promoting the project and um, eventually we, we managed to raise the money to get a ship down there. We spent five weeks just with our bare hands on the beaches collecting trash so that's the only way you can really do it somewhere like that it's a very hostile environment and you have to do it with blood sweat and tears thank you april it's really interesting to hear what you've been doing there um how much does all this pollution impact on biodiversity and the, the wider environment of the seychelles 
So plastic pollution is having very obvious impacts on biodiversity there, um, especially its marine turtle populations. So there's a lot of entanglement happening offshore, but it's also now happening on the beaches. So turtles are coming up to try and lay their eggs and then they're getting entangled on the beaches or they're not finding anywhere clear to actually lay their eggs. There's also ingestion impacts as well. But beyond just the plastic pollution problem, there's the threat of climate change and um, Seychelles is one of the most impacted areas around the globe for coral reefs under the impact of increased sea surface temperatures. So in 1998 and again in 2016, there were global bleaching events where Seychelles lost up to 90% of its coral cover. And this is the basis of the marine food web in the tropical regions like Seychelles. And therefore it has huge impacts on biodiversity of the marine ecosystems, um, not least to mention fish populations, of course, which everyone relies upon. Um, Seychelles' main economy is fishing and tourism, so hugely reliant upon these coral reef ecosystems. And of course they export huge amounts of uh, tuna from Seychelles to countries like the UK. So again, we're, we're having that effect on So we've got a very complex interconnected web around the world and what we do here is is affecting countries well beyond Britain. Absolutely. Alison, what about effects within Britain on things like biodiversity and the natural world? Well, Britain is clearly a much more impoverished ecosystem than places like the Seychelles. Uh, in England, for example, we have 70% of our land is, is farmland, 11% is urban, so only 19% is other ecosystems, and of that 10% is forest, and a lot of that is actually managed plantation forest. So we only have maybe about 15% of our land is um, any kind of semi-natural ecosystem in this country. As a result, our wildlife has really suffered, so we've had, in terms of the index of species abundance for priority species in the UK, since 1970 that's fallen to one third of what it used to be. So abundance of our most important threatened species is really falling quite rapidly. Um, and, and this is mirrored around the globe with sort of recent falls reported in insect populations. In Germany, for example, flying insects on their nature reserves fell by 75% since the 1980s, which is quite catastrophic, really. And of course, those insect ecosystems underpin a lot of the other food systems for bats and birds and so on. So we really need to improve our, our biodiversity and our, our wildlife habitats in this country. And a lot of, are, they are still also being lost to development. So they're being fragmented, hedgerows are being ripped up, um, trees are being cut down. And again, this comes back to the planning system, which allows all this kind of destruction of the natural environment uh, within the planning system. So I think Alison's point that actually we have an impoverished landscape within the UK in the sense of you know, losing quite a lot of our biodiversity and April's point that actually everything is interconnected, not just our environmental systems, but our economic systems are deeply interconnected. Those two points are particularly important. And the other thing that's interconnected is the way ideas flow around the world. And the UK has had a disproportionate impact on thinking about the environment uh, over the last few decades. To take one example, the UK Treasury in 2006 Seven launched the Stern Review on the Economics of Climate Change, which had a very significant impact in changing the way people thought about the costs and benefits of taking action uh, on climate change. And Lord Stern, of course, uh, is associated with Oxford and Oxford academics, uh, including myself, helped him with the review. The Treasury is just now launching a new review on the economics of biodiversity led uh, by Professor Partha Dasgupta, and uh, that review potentially promises to do for biodiversity what Stern did for climate, which is to say really lift the level of understanding of the significance of biodiversity to our economies. I mean, how many people know that if you wipe out large swathes of biodiversity, the stock market would collapse? Because actually, the profits and the revenues generated by the companies on those markets are as reliant upon our natural ecosystems and the planet functioning as we are reliant upon the planet functioning in order to live. So the, this, these interconnectednesses or interconnectedness between countries on the environmental and the economic level also map across you know, the, the economy and the environment themselves relate to one another. And that takes us naturally to the question of what do we do about the drivers of destruction here? 
because there are good economic reasons, good economic services provided by the things that are causing the damage. The reason we've got plastic pollution is that plastics are very, very useful. And they're not just useful to make our lives convenient. They're actually usefully environmentally as well. We, plastics reduce food waste. They can help us lighten our vehicles. They're used in the electronics that are required to shift ourselves off fossil fuels. So the challenge for us uh, is to reimagine and redesign these industries so that they are environmentally sustainable. And we are uh, launching here at Oxford, the Oxford Martin School is launching a program on the future of plastics to try and do just that on, on plastics. Now, that's easier said than done. Uh, for plastics, for instance, it means um, taking your feedstock, your carbon, which is in all the plastics, needs to come from the atmosphere rather than from fossil fuels. Uh, and you need to produce the plastics probably from trees that have captured the CO2 and refine the trees and produce the plastics that degrade rapidly enough that they don't end up entangled in a turtle or, or, or causing other forms of damage. Uh, and those scientific challenges are really very substantial. If it's not just plastics, we have to reimagine aviation and shipping and steel production. Uh, and these industries are currently very polluting from a greenhouse gas point of view, as well as in some cases in other particulates. For instance, shipping uses heavy fuel oil that has lots of uh, other local pollutants associated with it. And scientists, again, are thinking about how we could restructure these industries around fuels that don't have these impacts. So, for instance, um, there's... A lot of discussion and thinking and even some demonstration plants here in Oxford about the use of ammonia in the shipping industry. It's not without its drawbacks, but ammonia is a is produced from literally from sun, air and water. I mean, you, you, you need the energy from the sun, you need the nitrogen from the air and you need the hydrogen from the water. It's a chemical that has kept all of us alive. Hundreds of millions of people would be dead if we'd not known about it. Uh, because it, it is uh, intrinsic to the food system as it currently exists. As I say, it is it itself creates its own challenges. There are problems with uh, uh, ammonia pollution in some instances. But it's neutral to the atmosphere because it's based around nitrogen rather than a carbon uh, uh, base. So that's one possibility to explore. There are others. Uh, in steel, there are ways of making steel that used... Um, renewable electricity coupled with hydrogen and the hydrogen itself can be produced by splitting water water is h2o and if you put enough energy into it from from the sun uh, or from the wind you can split the h and the o apart and produce the hydrogen that you need to make the steel so so we need a complete shift in how we think about a lot of our industrial economies and the good news is that many British companies and British scientists are at the forefront of thinking about the pathways that might lead to making these currently unsustainable industries sustainable again. Yeah, I'd just like to come in there. So there's lots of these very exciting technological developments. I also just want to make the point that actually behaviour is really, really important. And just because we can make something doesn't necessarily mean that's the best option. So for example, with the biodegradable plastics, it's still better not to make those plastics at all and to use a reusable plastic container, for example. And there are like, in a few lucky places around the country, like Waitrose and Oxford, there are options springing up for bringing your own container and filling it up with your pasta and your rice and so on and taking it away. Um, you know, there's wonderful vegetable boxes that get delivered with no plastic packaging whatsoever from local organic farms in a cardboard box. So there are options for completely dispensing with that plastic in the first place. And then, of course, you also don't have the problem of where does the feedstock come from to create all these bioplastics. Land is really in short supply and we need the land for growing food and for, and for wildlife. We don't really want to be having huge plantations everywhere generating biomass just to make bioplastics and so on. I, th I see these things as and not either or. I mean, I, I also shop in the Waitrose with the reusable plastics. But the reality is that for many uses, we don't want substitutes or there aren't substitutes. We're not going to eliminate plastics, which is just a carbon and a hydrogen from human societies and cons because they're so fantastically useful. So the challenge is to reduce the consumption, absolutely, and to do what we can on behavioural change, absolutely, and to think about the technologies that we might deploy to have sustainable materials within those economies. 
you're talking about reimagining these industries, Cameron. That's the kind of thing that can take decades, I imagine, rather than years. We don't have decades, do we? Well, in some instances, no, we don't have decades. So we have to clear up the power system very, very quickly because it's the base of many of these other industries. You know, where do we get our energy from to do these material transformations that generate value, social and economic value? So the power system comes first and it's coming first. Uh, as I said right at the start, none of this is kind of on track or happening fast enough. You know, this is not a kind of Panglossian, it's fine story. It's not fine. Uh, but the direction of travel is, in many instances, heading the right way. And our challenge is to accelerate uh, action. And how do you motivate that? Well, we have a new program of research on the post-carbon transition that is developing this concept of sensitive intervention points in the economy. How do we identify the modest actions that could deliver outsized rapid returns? And this uses complexity science and complexity economics. But to give you a few examples, we need really major shifts in the way capital flows to do this reimagining of our industry. How can we get the trillions to stop flowing into unsustainable industries and to start flowing into sustainable industries? Well, one way might be to change the rules on auditing. It's not very sexy. It's not very exciting. It's probably not what's going to lead you to keep keep yourself up at night reading about it. But if you start to be clear with the world's investors that there are major risks faced by whether it's fossil fuel companies or other unsustainable companies, and that they're going to destroy billions, if not more, of shareholder capital, then that capital will vote with its feet, not that it has feet, but it will head towards the door, again, to mix my metaphors, uh, and start to be deployed into, into newer technology. So, for instance, what sort of oil price is consistent with the Paris Agreement on climate change? It's a reasonable question. Imagine for a moment, you know, perhaps we don't hit one and a half degrees of warming. Perhaps we blow past that, but we do stabilize at two degrees. What sort of oil price fits with a two degree world? Well, simplistically speaking, it might be somewhere between 20 or $40 a barrel. And in due course, you know, if your demand for oil gets down towards zero, uh, you know, if demand for something is zero, its price is not going to be very high. Now, currently, the books of the major oil companies are being valued as though that oil for the next few decades is worth $60, $70 a barrel. You put a more realistic price on it, and the market capitalization of those companies collapses. Once you realize that, actually, you want to get the proverbial out of those companies and into companies that are likely to be sustainable in the long run. So these are ways, small interventions like a shift in, shift in accounting guidance or a Swedish teenager doing a protest or uh, a shift in technology that then snowballs and gets picked up everywhere else. How do we find these interventions that can accelerate change? That's what we're working right. on. Or a television program about plastics in the Seychelles and the... Precisely. Yeah. yeah. What really strikes me actually listening to you is that a lot of these uh, redesigning is already happening. Mm. There's wonderful brains already working on all these problems at the Oxford Martin School, at Future Earth, all over the world. But there's a barrier to implementation. And I wonder if the government has the capacity to really think through these problems and cope with them. And I think that's probably where the barrier lies is that there's a lot of brilliant minds already redesigning how we could do things better but we're not pushing it forward, and that's government. Yeah, I mean, government is a key part of the story. But don't forget, you know, the power of leading enterprise to push government forward. So the Smith School here at Oxford of Enterprise and the Environment, one of our angles is to take the smaller number of businesses who actually properly see the future, see where it's going, see that actually the world needs these industries to be reimagined and, and to change. And they're taking the, the technologies that are in the university labs and starting to deploy them in the hope that eventually the rest of the world and, and governments and the laws and the policies will catch up and make them profitable because at the end of the day, they're also businesses. So there's this nice interplay between getting the brains to come up with solutions, getting them deployed initially by a far-sighted 
chief executive and then using that example to say to the policymakers, look, this can be done. It has been done. Now go and legislate or go and price it and go and force everybody else to come up to the the, the cutting edge that this leading company is at. In the Seychelles, you've seen government support for your initiatives, right? Yeah, they're, they're very aware in Seychelles that everything they do and everything they need to do in the future relies heavily upon their environment. Um, they're very much more in touch with their environment and they can see the changes happening, you know, year by year in the Seychelles. Whereas here we're a little bit uh, further removed from the impacts of everything that we do. And I think that makes a huge difference in the way that you manage your country. Um, like in this country, obviously, we're managing for the people that live in this country. But now we've got this new threat, this existential threat of climate change. So suddenly leaders are having to think not just about the people in their own country, but they do need to think about the people in the whole world. And that's probably really scary for them. You know, as leaders, you're not it's a much bigger challenge that they're now faced with sure, and, and whether they can whether they stick their head in the sand or they embrace it is is the question it's particularly difficult for political leaders in a country which is democratic in which lots of people are being faced with all sorts of misinformation from all around the place and don't can't necessarily believe bring themselves to believe what they're being told about the future i mean you were saying cameron about pricing, future pricing of oil. I mean, to some extent, that's a matter of until people actually believe that that's going to be the price, that isn't going to bring about the change that it will, will lead it to be the price, mm -hmm. right? That's right. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, markets are forward looking and they're based on people's beliefs. And what something is worth is what everybody believes, everybody else believes it's going to be worth. But uh, in the current world, as we know, people's beliefs are manipulable are. and not always by the good guys. <laughs> Well, uh, <laughs> you, you, you could put it like that, Peter. Uh, I mean, I, I think certainly whether or not the world thinks it's had enough of experts, of course, sitting here in Oxford, <laughs> we would say this, wouldn't we? But, but expertise is needed now more than ever before. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a worry that, I mean, thinking about the Seychelles, it's interesting. If there had been climate change impacts on Britain, on America... Uh, right early on of that sort of impact it, it it would have made a big difference i think to politics we're be, being situated where we are we're not one of the earliest countries to really suffer from climate change are we this is true but to map it back to your earlier point um don't forget that the that the us has had some very major uh climate related impacts as has countries like australia and the ability of those who don't wish to understand the science for various reasons to confuse the population into really wondering, you know, is this climate change? Maybe it's not. Um, it's always fluctuations. There's always extreme events. You know, can you really, is this really a signal of anything or is it just the earth? I mean, these, these, the, the kind of doubts that are raised by climate skeptics as in the same way that doubts were raised about the impact of and the link between tobacco and cancer has been very effective at um, slowing down people's understanding of the science uh, and enabling us to take the appropriate action in response to the science. It's interesting, I think, that plastics have had such a resonance in the public mind, perhaps because there it is very obvious. You see the turtles entangled and so forth, and David Attenborough does a programme on that, and everybody suddenly is taking notice. I mean, Alison, do you think there's the prospect of that in Britain by focusing more on the the green landscape, the effect on biodiversity in the country, the living environment, that sort of thing. I hope so. I mean, I think with plastics, what helped was that it's not a big sacrifice to anyone to have to go without using a plastic bag. It doesn't take that much effort to gradually get used to bringing your reusable bag along to the supermarket. And in fact, it's it kind of saves money eventually. So there's the plastic bag tax and the regulation pushing that forward has been a big kind of success story in terms of slashing our use of plastic bags in supermarkets by, I think, 90-something percent. With climate change, it's a bit harder because we are actually asking people to make individual sacrifices. We, know we do need to be driving less, flying less, eating less meat. That's, that's really clear, and that's going to require individual behaviour change, which will be viewed as a sacrifice in many, in many cases, even though there are health benefits in terms of eating more healthily, getting more exercise and so on. Um, Nevertheless, it does require people to make significant changes. And I think that does 
slow down the uptake of those measures. But in terms of biodiversity, there are really clear synergies between climate change, biodiversity benefits, um, climate adaptation. So treating our land as, as natural capital on a par with financial capital. Our land doesn't just provide food and fresh water, it also provides flood protection. Um, trees can protect against flooding, against soil erosion. We're losing three million tonnes of topsoil every year from our fields, which is costing the country's farmers millions of pounds. Um, How are we losing that? Erosion, uh, especially from increase in winter cereal crops, for example, maize, potato crops, um, especially in the areas of the country that have naturally erodible soils and with more extreme rainfall events as well. It's all kind of perfect storm. So we have been losing topsoil gradually, steadily over the years. And, and in many places in the UK, it's being lost at a much faster rate than it's being replaced and, and reformed. So is that impacting it on fertility? It is soil fertility and also carbon storage in soils, which clearly has a, a knock-on impact right. on, on carbon storage and, and climate change. Right. I mean, Cameron, you were painting a rather more optimistic picture, perhaps. I mean, thinking of the the plastic bags and so on that Alison was mentioning, I mean, their legisla legislation was the key, right? I mean, a, a, a small price got put on plastic bags by the government and it's hugely changed behaviour. And you were talking about looking for those little levers where you can make a change, a small change that makes a big change. Can you see answers to some of these problems in such things? Yeah, I mean, our team currently has 30 different papers on the go, each one looking at one of these sensitive intervention points. So could, could this this modest intervention deliver outsized change? And in a sense, they're not s small changes uh, because of the impact, you know, the five... Can you give some examples? Yeah, so I, I gave the one about auditing and accounting guidance. Um, there's a whole host of them in technology. So um, as technologies move down their learning curve, they get cheaper. And as they get cheaper, you want to deploy more of them. As you deploy more of them, those financing them feel the risks fall, which means they'll give them a lower interest rate or cost of capital, which means they get cheaper, which means you deploy more. And, and then you get these synergies between different clusters of technologies. So the more renewables you have on the grid, the cleaner an EV is. Uh, the more EVs you sell, the more batteries you're deploying, which means the cost of batteries goes down, which means the cost of storage goes down, which means the value of the solar and the wind goes up, which means you deploy more solar and wind and so on and so forth. So there's lots of synergies in technology. On litigation, uh, if you... Uh, I just spent yesterday with um, the Supreme Court judges of China who are over on an executive education program with Client Earth. And Client Earth is an organisation that you know, sues companies for damaging the earth. Their client is the earth. And that's an example of a small intervention. One or two lawsuits succeed, and then other people think, oh, great, I could do that too. So there are copies of client earth in many different countries now, increasingly well-funded, increasingly you know, harassing and suing fossil fuel and other anti-environmental interests really very effectively. So but there are many, many, many of these examples where, where a modest intervention can trigger a much greater change. Actually, one more. Um, if you were to put on a, a border adjustment for carbon, so if you price carbon within your economy, but you say all embodied CO2 coming into the economy has to same the, pay the same carbon price, entirely legitimate policy to take. It's not protectionist. It's, it's making sure that the playing field is level between domestic. Can you spell out a little bit more fully yeah. what that involves? So this is the idea here is that if you put a price on carbon, so if you're emitting CO2, you have to pay that price. But the price not only applies to those within your country who are emitting the CO2, it applies also to goods that you're importing that have been made by emitting CO2. So you can calculate what's called the embodied carbon dioxide in those goods and the imports have to pay the same price as the domestic production. As though it had been produced in this country. Precisely right. So it's levelling the playing field. But the beauty of that is that once you've got that kind of border adjustment, what you're doing is collecting money from countries that don't have a carbon price. The moment they put a carbon price in place, they collect the money. So you're incentivizing other countries 
to put their own carbon prices in place. And the more, so one country puts one in place, then others want one too. And then you get a snowball effect until actually everybody wants to have the carbon price because they want to collect the money. So just to be clear, um, does that mean then that the British government say when it's, uh, something's being imported and let's suppose there's a hundred dollars worth of carbon there, if the country from which it's imported hasn't charged any tax for the carbon, then the British government would say, well, pay a hundred dollars for that Correct. shipment. But if the country from which it's come has already charged, say, $70 of tax, then the British government would say, well, that's 30 Yeah, or, or, or to make things simple, um, provided it's close enough to 100 nothing at all. I mean, if, you, if you're going to be pr perfectly precise about it, yes, you'd pay a top-up of 30 uh, But sometimes these things are a bit difficult to measure, and you just say, do, if you've got a roughly commensurate carbon price with ours, then you know, we're even. So, and the uh, carbon price in that other country would have to accrop apply across the board, I assume. They wouldn't be able to say just, oh, I see you're exporting that to the UK. Pay us $100, thank you very much. Well, it would be quite tricky for the country concerned administratively to just um, segment its pricing regime. Yeah. So you, what you'd end up with, and they, they need to do it anyway. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a trigger for them it gives to say, them a very, do something you should be doing anyway. Very strong incentive for doing yeah. it. So it's a way of spreading this policy effect globally with a, with a knock-on snowball kind of consequence. Is there any chance at all, though, in terms of you know geopolitical realities, of that kind of thing getting past the World Trade Organization and the current kind of race to all these horrendous trade agreements with no standards whatsoever? So WTO is fine. Uh, it's, not, it's not easy, but I think it's Article 20 that permits this kind of um, adjustment. And um, the, the question, I mean, the reason they haven't been applied thus far, I think, is that people have been concerned about it being perceived to be a protectionist measure uh, or a, a so-called dirty tariff. But, uh, I mean, let's face it, we're in a horrifically protectionist world right now. I mean, I, you know, compared to the other things going on, well, A, this is not protectionist in the first place. It's actually leveling a playing field. But even if it were perceived to be protectionist, it, it wouldn't be perceived to be as protectionist as half of the trade war sort of uh, policies in place right now. Isn't there another way governments can help too from the point of view of anticipating the way they want the market to go by putting finance into an advanced market commitment is, is that right yeah i mean this is an interesting idea that's been used successfully particularly in the medical area in vaccines but also in some renewable technologies where, where the government says we want a technology to meet these requirements and they specify the requirements uh, and we open it up if you can produce this technology we will buy so many units at such a price uh, now another way of doing it is to run a kind of an auction you say, we want so many megawatt hours of clean electricity. Uh, who can? It's called a reverse auction because the price goes down instead of up in the auction. Uh, and the cheapest provider wins a big contract to do it. And what we've seen uh, in the renewables area is these auctions have been used very, very effectively to push prices of renewable energy down. Some people say push them to levels that are artificially low, but they're, they're radically cheaper than any fossil fuel price can deliver. And these auctions are always won by solar or wind these days. The, the hope is that you know, not, not only can the solar and wind providers deliver at those low prices, that they'll make a profit at those low prices and will gradually extend you know, the technologies across the world. And it also forces those who are working in competing technologies, the dirty technologies, to look ahead with confidence to a future where they're going to be out of business if they carry on doing the same thing. That's right. And, and for me, a key stat is how much new fossil fuel investment do we have coming down the pipeline? And as it stands, the last time I checked, it's around 350 gigawatts of, of new coal. That's a lot. I mean, the UK's power capacity in total is you know 60-ish uh, gigawatts. We're probably running right now at 40 gigawatts of, of production. But uh, a few years ago, that was over 1,000 gigawatts of new coal planned. So a lot of that's been cancelled. And that's good news. Um, the bad news is that it's still 350 gigawatts in the pipeline should be zero. Yeah. April, how do you think people in the Seychelles look upon this behaviour by rich countries such as the UK? I think there is a, an awakening to the idea that they are 
living the consequences of other people's actions. Um, you know, in the last 10 years in Seychelles, social media has boomed. And so there's much more information flowing around. Um, and the president is very engaged with these global issues. So I think people are aware of, of that it's not, you know, it's not them causing the issues that they're now having to, well, pay a lot of money to deal with and live with the consequences of. So it'll be interesting to see how um, that unrolls over the next few years. Right. I mean, has there been a big much evidence of countries that are affected a lot by environmental change, as it were, shaming the rich countries into activity? Well, we did think about doing that with the plastics project um, initially to try and get some funding, but then we thought it wasn't a great idea to be shaming everyone. Um, but it's not a bad idea in the long run to, well, in fact, it's going to have to happen because, you know, plastic pollution is one thing, but Seychelles, they don't have the the capacity, financial capacity to deal with um, all this plastic pollution. Um, their economy will be hit hard by climate change um, in the coming years. That's without a doubt. It's already happening. So yeah. So exposing that to the rest of the world and saying yeah, but um, play fair. Yeah. yeah. So the the president of Seychelles has recently he's been to a lot of these um, ocean summits, etc., and he's been. Uh, talking about the issue of plastic pollution in particular, but also about how we must protect our oceans. And this has already galvanised quite a big change in that uh, countries like Norway have put forward a pot of money to tackle um, waste management in developing countries like Seychelles. So there are changes already happening because a light has been shone on these impacts in Seychelles, which is quite nice. I really like the idea that seeing some of the awful things that are happening in beautiful places like the Seychelles might actually motivate the British public to take these things more seriously. That that gives the media a, a very important role in, in changing hearts and minds. Alison? Yes, I, I think one thing that's really powerful is to show people a positive vision of how good things can be. And the interesting thing with the Blue Planet series that sparked a lot of the plastic concern was that the first series will be a lot of stuff about amazing ecosystems and then a tiny bit at the end about how they're getting, how there are bad things happening and how we, how we really need to change. Um, and I think if you focus too much on the bad things, it can actually turn people off and they kind of give up hope. But if you focus on the multiple benefits that we can get from some environmental actions, that, that can be a really positive thing. Uh, and one of the big areas where we get these multiple benefits is, is with nature-based solutions. So, for example, for climate mitigation, we really need to um, plant lots of forests um, to restore the carbon in soil and wetlands. And if you do that the right way, you can have huge benefits for nature and for flood protection and for cultural value for people. So if you're planting native forests or restoring degraded wetlands, for example, you can be locking up carbon in the soil and in the trees, but also providing habitat for biodiversity and beautiful places for people to to explore. Um, but if you do it the wrong way with commercial timber plantations, which are um, planted in the wrong place, with very little benefit for biodiversity, um, perhaps displacing natural grassland ecosystems, for example, that can actually be quite damaging. So it's really important to get the details right and to look at the big picture and all the synergies and trade-offs. So does that mean we need some generally respected and reliable way of auditing these things so that we've not got companies just as it were greenwashing by artificially meeting certain targets but in the wrong way definitely i think that that's the case we do need standards and certification and there has been some work already on this uh, in the context of red which is reduced emissions from deforestation and soil degradation um, which people tend to fund through voluntary carbon offsets so there have been various certification schemes developed but i think we do need much more emphasis on now that there's a big focus now on greenhouse gas removal and tree planting is one of those technologies there's a big emphasis that we need to get this right or it could cause more damage yeah, I'd rather, rather strongly agree with that, uh, Alison and Peter, because I think the the amount of uh, effort and activity in this area is really now starting to scale up. I think uh, Shell, the oil company, is now spending something like two or three hundred million a year alone on these kind of nature based solutions. And it's very, very important that as we do more in this domain, which, as Alison says, is very important to hit multiple objectives at the same time that we do it in the right way. Because what you don't want are a set of companies that pull the wool over the eyes of the public, uh, which is actually worse than doing nothing. If we think that they're doing something, but it's pure greenwash, then we're in a real mess. And being honest about where we are winning and where we're losing 
is kind of a, a central foundation for for making progress here. And how is Joe Public or Jill Public going to know which are the companies that are doing the right thing and which are just greenwashing? Well, standards can help, as Alison says, and and there are some good uh, voluntary standards that have been developed. The government had a review of this area actually about a decade ago um, to work out whether they needed a government-approved mark and ultimately decided not to at that point in time. But sometimes I think the government does have a, a role to play in simply saying... It's, it's a bit like the Advertising Standards Agency. You know, if, if you're speaking uh, BS, to use a technical term, <laughs> that may not make it into your podcast, uh, then, then you, you, you need to be hauled over the coals for it. So then there needs to be uh, punishment for those who are effectively uh, spreading untruths. <laughs> I think the world is far <laughs> removed from that at the moment, isn't well, it? Well, yeah, sadly, sadly, you're right. <laughs> but, uh, but, but in this, in the consumer standards area, uh, there are rules and regulations yes. and laws about how you can sell a product to a consumer. Now, now, what you what you say on Twitter about you know another person that's um, less well regulated, but uh, but the marketplace does have to have government regulation and involvement for it to work properly. And this would be regulation, would it, not of the form doing such and such is a good thing. It would be more objective, perhaps, such as this is an activity that is in conformity with the declared requirements. Yeah, so you could, you could imagine a kind of uh, compatibility with the sustainable development goals or one or more specific goals. Um, I mean, these things are difficult to to implement uh, and to make very clear to the consumer. And I'm not sure we're quite there yet, uh, but it would be very, very helpful as we start to scale up activity in the greenhouse gas removal area. Now, if I may, greenhouse gas removal isn't just about tree planting, though. Uh, as Alison points out, you know, soils are very important here. I think there's kind of a couple of thousand, two to three thousand uh, gigatons of carbon dioxide locked up in trees, whereas there's five and a half thousand gigatons of carbon dioxide locked up in soils. Uh, and so s- soil management is very important, but there are some industrial mechanisms as well that can remove CO2 from the atmosphere. And we have been studying, you know, a number, in fact, 10 of them here at Oxford, looking at the different potential scale and the different potential economics of these, of these approaches to take CO2 out of the atmosphere. And how promising are those looking? I mean, when I hear you say you're trying 10 of them, actually, I feel less optimistic than if you were just trying two. It kind of suggests that you might be casting around for... Well, 10 is actually already a short list, having discarded some that many academics think are going to be absolutely vital to addressing climate change in due course. And, you know, they may well be right. Time will tell. So all these 10 are genuinely promising. They have potential, yeah. Um, now, some of them have potential to reduce emissions rather than net remove um, CO2 out of the atmosphere. But uh, to, take, uh, to take a couple of examples, if there's a process called direct air capture, uh, which many of us think is unlikely to be economic at scale, but you never know that actually literally scrubs CO2 from air using uh, different amines, other chemicals, and then gets a pure stream of CO2. And you can then either simply bury that or use it to produce fuels or plastics. Of course, if you use fuels, they're going to be burnt and the CO2 goes back up again. So you've got a closed loop. You're not emitting net anymore, but nor are you net removing from the atmosphere. So uh, what we are doing is looking at the life cycle emissions as well as the costs, as well as the prospects of, um, of technological advancement in each of these pathways. Well, thank you very much for that. That's been a, a fascinating discussion with some rather uh, optimistic points and some that are rather more pessimistic. Uh, I'd be very interested just summing up to hear what you your hopes are uh, and how optimistic or otherwise you feel with regard to the next five, ten years. April? I do feel optimistic, especially with the power of education and, and media reaching the public and, and really galvanising change and understanding on the global issues. What's missing at the moment is that we need um, leadership that are going to tackle the issue head on and not just, you know, side swing it. And I feel that's probably what's taking place now and we do need rapid action so 
yeah, fingers crossed for a good leadership. So optimistic if the right leaders come to the fore, but worry that they won't. Yes, I just worry that we don't have the people that are qualified to tackle this issue in leadership. Cameron? We're clearly not in an ideal place, as the Irishman says. You know, if you want to get there, I wouldn't start from here. Uh, I don't know why it's an Irishman, by the way. Should be, I should have said an Australian, as I'm one of them. <laughs> uh, but uh, I am also optimistic in the sense that, as I said earlier, we've got this massive increase in the number of brains trying to collectively solve this question. We have a much greater awareness at the level of teenagers and those in their 20s about this issue, far more than my generation or, or the next one. And the pressure that is being applied by that generation is significantly greater. And I've seen a real change just in the last year, actually, in the responsiveness of our political leaders and others, declaring climate emergency in this country, legislating for a target of net zero emissions, the Chinese now talking about net zero emissions, which that was so far from the agenda five or 10 years ago. So really major progress. And then, you know, what, what to do? Well, first thing is let's avoid locking in further fossil fuel infrastructure that would last for 30 or 50 years that we're going to have to scrap. You know, don't do the harm. Um, the second thing is you've had a lot of sensible suggestions from April and Alison, hopefully a few from me too, in terms of how to actually make our country and the world as a whole greener. So let's do the good things. Um, but thirdly, there's a kind of meta point it's quite fundamental. We're still not measuring the right things. In terms of our economic and political leadership, it is still all about gross domestic product. And we have had a project on wealth and measuring the wealth of the nation, not the gross output of the nation. Because when you measure wealth correctly, you don't have a full picture of your country's wealth unless you're measuring your country's natural wealth as well. And so that takes you in to the other sexiest area of this discussion, which is the Office of National Statistics. <laughs> yeah. uh, and it's all, it's all about making sure that we have proper measurements of the wealth in our soils, the wealth in our forests, the wealth in our rivers, and the wealth in our air. And believe it or not, the UK's Office of National Statistics has a new program and properly resourced looking at these things to start to develop what are called natural capital accounts. So that sort of thing leaves me feeling more optimistic too. Right, thank you. Quite a lot of positive signs there. Alison? I could be optimistic in a way because I think if we wanted to, if we really showed the leadership and the commitment, we could reduce our impact on the environment almost overnight because you can do so much with behaviour change, switching off lights, changing your diet, choosing not to fly off on holiday. These things are instantaneous. They don't require a long lead time to develop a new technology. Um, if everyone in the world went the same way, then we could achieve a huge amount of change almost overnight. Um, and I think, as Cameron mentioned, young people these days are becoming much more aware. So, you know, I, I do see some hope when I look at the young people and the way their thinking has changed recently. There does seem to be less focus on consumption, um, sort of, you know, the hedonistic treadmill of always buying more and more glamorous items, you know, faster cars, bigger houses. I do see that they are starting to move away from that kind of mindset. So that does give me hope for the future and, and some optimism. But as April said, we definitely need much stronger leadership. And it's not in enough just to set a goal and say, yes, we're going to be net zero by 2050. We need the policies to back that up. And the Committee on Climate Change report points out that we've only implemented one of their 25 policies, um, which are needed to get ourselves back on track, even to achieve our existing carbon targets let alone our new ones so we, we need much much stronger leadership uh, and then if that does happen then i will be optimistic thank you very much that's been a really interesting discussion i hope you've enjoyed it too thank you thank, thank, thank you so thank much you. my thanks again to cameron alison and april for their time today i do hope you've also enjoyed what's been another absorbing future makers discussion by the way, we're always on the lookout for new ideas for episodes. So please leave us a review, and when you do, let us know your thoughts on what we could talk about in future series. And I hope you'll join me next time 
as we build on today's discussion and talk about whether it's possible for us as individuals to change the direction of man-made climate change. Until then, I'm Peter Milliken, and you've been listening to Future Makers.